In order to change a policy, or even indeed to fundamentally transform an entire civilization, one does not necessarily need 51% agreement with the new set of ideas. In fact, even 80% agreement with the new set of ideas might still not be enough. What is a lot more important is to have a 10% hardline or stubborn minority. That is what changes things. It is rarely the case that a policy dispute or a cultural war is being won by the moderates. The absolute rule is that the most hardline minority wins. And this is something we need to learn really fast. Let's explore. Hello everyone and welcome to the Freedom Alternative. Alright, so in February, during the video called Polarization Needs to be Embraced, I asserted that the cultural war is not and will not be won by the moderates. And that indeed the moderates are at best good to serve as useful idiots and otherwise generally useless. I then expanded a bit on this during the Practical Politics class on Subversion in the video called The Basics of Subversion, a video which I absolutely urge you to go watch if you haven't seen it already, because otherwise some things said here might not make entire sense. The 10% rule, or perhaps the 10% the theory would be a much more apt name, is a propensity in the life of a political operative that everyone should bear in mind at any given moment in time, especially journalists, commentators, and of course political operatives who actually want to achieve results. As usual with things that really matter, this aspect is rarely considered in the current year. The political right is the worst offender by far, with only a tiny minority of right-wing political operatives even being aware of the phenomenon, although right-leaning media is a bit more woke on this, although this phenomenon is rarely identified in a correct manner. On the left, it is the opposite. Most leftist political operatives are fully aware of its existence, whilst most leftist media is largely ignorant of the phenomenon. So, as usual, I don't claim to have the whole truth on the matter, but I do claim that my experience of over a decade in the trenches of influencing policy is a decent enough starting point uh, uh, to at least have a minimal blueprint about how this works. Naturally, I also try to tie this talk with some more practical politics advice or suggestions, if you like, because publishing well-polished essays might do good for stroking one's ego, but they accomplish mostly nothing in the lot of regular people. So, for the purposes of this video, the presentation is divided as follows. 1. What is the 10% rule? 2. Historical examples of it being successfully exploited. 3. Limitations of the 10% rule. 4. How did the right manage to lose sight of the 10% rule? Three, 5. Present-day attempts at using it. 6. Using the rule as an individual activist or small group. And of course, number 7. Conclusions. As usual, the video will be quite long and is one of the reasons I've been publishing slightly less often uh, lately, because putting these videos together isn't particularly easy and I'd rather provide quality material than a high amount of videos. After all, commenting the daily news is fun, but not exactly unique nor highly useful. Uh, Alright, let us begin. So, what is the 10% rule? And maybe I should get into the habit of saying the 10% rule in sociopolitics, 
because there is also a 10% rule in ecology. But the two are somewhat related. In ecology, the 10% rule refers to the food chain, and it is the rule according to which when energy is passed in an e ecosystem from one trophic level to the next, only 10% of the energy will be passed on. A trophic level is the position of an organism in a food chain or energy pyramid. So basically, rabbits compared to almost every other animal. The domestic cat, for instance, is on a superior trophic level to the rabbit. The 10% rule in sociopolitics is coming from a very similar tradition, which is not by accident, because any functional theory in politics eventually has its roots in biology and immutable traits of human nature. So the 10% rule in sociopolitics says that an intransigent minority needs no more than 10% of the sum total of a group to impose its belief on the entirety of the group. Or to make a parallel with the ecology rule, only the energy of the 10% is transmitted to the next step of functioning, while the vast majority remains, at best, merely background noise, or sheep, or cattle, or useful idiots. Call it what you like. The principle stays the same. Now, when you phrase it like this, most people react in astonishment. How could this be? or in a more Cathy Newman-esque style, so you're saying that 90% or more of the populace are just a, my, a bunch of mindless lobsters? <laughs> Such reactions, while indeed wrong, are perfectly understandable, especially in the current year. For most of our lives, and in the case of those outside of the Intermarium, for the entirety of our lives, We've been raised and inculcated with the idea that, generally speaking, things change when there is a broad agreement, whether that agreement is pushed by a top-down power or from the grassroots is a different story. But the broad agreement is allegedly necessary in order for change to occur. This is how most people imagine change happens today as well. This impression is further reinforced by the fact that most people, including most commentators, are only briefly informed on the lessons of history, and that is at best. A surprisingly high proportion of teachers, commentators and journalists are downright historically illiterate. As a result, most people aren't even aware of the myriad of changes that occurred throughout history without most people agreeing with those said changes. And I don't mean changes uh, already acknowledged that as being illegitimate, such as the installment of communism in the Intermarium, but I mean changes deemed today as being either innocuous or even logical. But until we get to historical examples, I also need to mention here that while the 10% rule is neither absolute nor perfect, it is as close to a scientific theory as you can get in sociopolitics. As we all know, in politics there is a degree of relativity and a degree of unpredictability, because after all, we are all dealing with people, not with machines and mathematical constructs. That's why the theory of gravity works the same every single time it is being tested. But the 10% rule in sociopolitics is as close as it can get to a, th to a theory in a scientific sense. Namely, that a phenomenon has been observed, it has been tested in a, a multitude of times, and its limitations and extent have been thoroughly documented to the extent that it can be embraced as a standalone truth and a constant in life, pretty much like gravity. So, let's look at some of the examples of it being tested. So, point number two, historical examples of it being successfully exploited. Now, I could make a five hours long video just on this subthread alone, so instead I'll just briefly mention some examples that I believe are relevant and then leave some documentation in the description box should you wish to read more on the topic. Also, I am willing to provide additional documentation upon request on certain examples to patrons and honest researchers. So. Uh, one such example is the unification of Italy. I have used this example in the past in one of the next narrative episodes where I engaged in the dangerous practice of making predictions 
but based on this same immutable rule, namely that even big civilizational changes don't really need a general or generalized consensus. The unification of Italy is one of example of an almost tectonic shift in European politics that few people dare to imagine it could even be possible, and this shift occurred in less than 50 years, even though it did not have broad approval at all. In fact, it doesn't particularly have broad approval to this day, but that's a separate discussion altogether. In schools and universities today, the unification of Italy is often portrayed as a logical step, more or less supported at least by the elite of the peninsula, and that generally the unification process is a string of wars and persuasion campaigns to get popular support for the idea. That couldn't be further from the truth. In reality, the revolutionaries who wanted this uh, never amassed more than 10% support, either in the elite or in the general populace, but the revolutionaries learned about the 10% rule the hard way. <clears throat> because at first, they too believed that if they just get the popular support, everything will be honky-dory. Their problem was that getting public support was next to impossible. And they learned that the hard way in 1820 during the so-called Two Sicilies insurrection, which is considered to be or to have been the first step in the 50-ish years of struggle to unite Italy. While the insurrection at first was successful, things degenerated really fast because there was no public support and their whole thing fell apart really fast at the first challenge and the revolutionaries ended up in exile or dead. That, however, gave the revolutionary an idea. What if we don't need the public support? What if we just create a stubborn enough minority? So, over the next several decades, all the revolutionaries did was to stoke passions in the minority of the population that were willing to listen to them. Anyway, long story short, the revolutionaries shifted their attention from aiming to get public support to radicalizing their most passionate, already existent supporters. They no longer tried to persuade the general public or the elites in the uh, eight Italian states but instead aimed to persuade their supporters to infiltrate whatever they could infiltrate and act as the stubborn guy who won't shut up about how great unification is. That was a dangerous bet, because it could lead to war, and indeed not just one war, but several wars did indeed happen because of this stubbornness. But in the end, it worked. If you have the time to read in great detail about the unification of Italy, you will notice that the turning point in the propaganda war, because that's exactly what the revolutionaries were doing from 1830 onwards, was the execution of the Bandiera brothers. The actions of the authorities were successfully portrayed as disproportional and mean. And the fact that the brothers allegedly shouted Viva l'Italia as they were being executed helped the cause quite a lot. It doesn't even matter whether they actually shouted that or not. All that matter is the narrative. And the revolutionaries absolutely won the narrative. And the primary consequence uh, when you win on narrative is that you get your chance at exploiting the 10% rule. Now, Winning on narrative is not the only way to get to the point where you can exploit the 10% rule for your own purposes. There are other ways too, such as intransigent practices inside the tiny minority. And to exemplify this, I will read a few paragraphs from Nassim Nicolas Taleb's Skin in the Game series, where he describes how Egypt and other Middle Eastern places became Muslim faster by peaceful means rather than by war. Few people know that Muslim-initiated wars against Christians were indeed more successful in bringing new converts than peaceful preaching by Muslims, but it was the post-war intransigent in-group practices of the Muslims that were even more successful than war. So, uh, Taleb explains, very long quote, uh, 
The spread of Islam in the Near East, where Christianity was heavily entrenched, as in it was born there, can be attributed to two simple asymmetries. The original Islamic rulers weren't particularly interested in converting Christians as these provided them with tax revenues. The proselytism of Islam did not address those so-called people of the book, i.e. individuals of Abrahamic faith. In fact, my ancestors, who survived 13 centuries under Muslim rule, saw advantages in not being Muslim, mostly in the avoidance of military conscription. The two asymmetric rules were as follows. First, if a non-Muslim man under the rule of Islam marries a Muslim woman, he needs to convert to Islam. And if either parents of a child happens to be Muslim, the child will be Muslim. Second, becoming Muslim is irreversible, as apostasy is the heaviest crime under the religion sanctioned by the death penalty. The famous Egyptian actor Omar Sharif, born Mikhail Dimitri Shalhoub, was of Lebanese Christian origin. He converted to Islam to marry a famous Egyptian actress and had to change his name to an Arabic one. He later divorced, but did not revert to the faith of his ancestors. Under these two asymmetric rules, one can do simple simulation and see how a small Islamic group occupying Christian Coptic Egypt can lead over the centuries to the Copts becoming a tiny minority. All one needs is a small rate of interfaith marriages. Likewise, one can see how Judaism doesn't spread and tends to stay in the minority as the religion has opposite rules. The mother is required to be Jewish, causing interfaith marriages to leave the community. An even stronger asymmetry than that of Judaism explains the depletion in the Near East of three Gnostic faiths, the Druze, the Yazidi, and the Mandians. Unlike Islam, that requires either parents to be Muslim, then Judaism, that requires for at least the mother to have the faith, these three religions require both parents to be of the faith, otherwise the parents says to the loo, to the community. Egypt has a flat terrain. The distribution of the population presents homogeneous mixtures there, which permits renormalization, that is to say, it allows the asymmetric rule to prevail. But in places such as Lebanon, Galilee, and northern Syria with mountainous terrain, Christians and other non-Sunni Muslims remained concentrated. Christians, not being exposed to Muslims, experienced no intermarriage. Egypt's Copts suffered from another problem, the irreversibility of Islamic conversions. Many Copts during Islamic rule converted to Islam when it was merely an administrative procedure, something that helps one land a job or handle a problem that requires Islamic jurisprudence. One do, do not have to really believe in it, since Islam doesn't conflict, uh, conflict markedly with Orthodox Christianity. Little by little, a Christian or Jewish family bearing the uh, Marano-style conversion becomes truly converted, as a couple of generations later, the descendants forget the arrangement of their ancestors. So all Islam did was out-stubborn Christianity, which itself won thanks to its own stubbornness. For, before Islam, the original spread of Christianity in the Roman Empire can be largely seen due to the binding intolerance of Christians, their unconditional, aggressive and proselyting recalcitrance. Roman pagans were initially tolerant of Christians, as the tradition was to share gods with other members of the empire. But they wondered why these Nazarenes didn't want to give and take gods and offer that Jesus fellow to the Roman pantheon in exchange for some other gods. What? Our gods aren't good enough for them? But Christians were intolerant of Roman paganism. The per persecutions of the Christians had vastly more to do with the intolerance of the Christian for the pantheon and local ga gods than the reverse. What we read in history is written by the Christian side, not the Greek-Roman one. Close quote. Now, I would advise you to read that long article in its entirety, though we might quote from it again during this course, even though Taleb gets some things wrong. But nevertheless, that article is the closest thing to a scientific explanation of the current topic that you can find without paying heavy shekels for it. In any event, stubbornness is one efficient way to, to exploit the 10% rule. 
The Muslims did not win on narrative during the lifetime of the first or even the second or third generation of occupation, but they still ended up being dominant because of their stubbornness. The exact same thing is being played out in the current year in Sweden, the United Kingdom, France or other places that are in the process of Islamization. The so-called moderates, some of them out of stupidity, some of them out of ignorance, and indeed some of them out of bad intentions and bad character, like to sneer at the idea and say things like, come on, what Islamization? There are no more than 5 million Muslims in Germany, and that's a generous number, and it's not like Islam is mandatory or anything. Don't like it? Don't convert to Islam. It's that simple. Well, it's not that simple. Because Germany has a mostly flat terrain. Not as flat as Egypt, but still close enough. So even the tiniest amount of intermarriage, combined with the stubbornness of Islam, which works today just like it worked 1,000 years ago, that puts Germany on an almost irreversible course to Islamization. Sure, it won't happen in five years, it won't happen even in 50 years, but unless deportations begin, Germany of the year 2300 will, for sure, speak mostly Arabic. The German language will still be around in Switzerland and the more mountainous areas of modern-day Germany, but the way things are going, there won't be anyone speaking German in, uh, in public, let's say, in places like the North Rhine and Westphalia, for instance. All with just mere stubbornness, patience, and 5% of the populace. Also, this works uh, rather logarithmically than exponentially, so the difference between the effects of 2% versus 3% is minuscule, but the difference between 2% and 5% is quite big, and the difference between 5% and 10% is enormous. Basically, barring some catastrophic event, at 10% they won. It's just that simple. All right, one more example, also an example I used in the past, namely the increasingly totalitarian policies regarding vices, particularly alcohol and tobacco in the United Kingdom. I explained this uh, example in great detail in the video The False Civil Society and Government Charities, published in April 2017, a video which is also mandatory watch for those of you interested in practical politics. The short version is this. The vast, vast majority of Britons agree with me that the smoking regulations are absolutely retarded and that the alcohol guidelines come from an entirely different planet. But that doesn't matter. What matters is who writes the policy. And the less than 1% of the populace that thinks any amount of alcohol represents mortal danger, that small group that feels they are already making a concession by the fact that they still allow some people to purchase some alcohol, that group is, and has historically been, motivated enough to do the tedious bureaucratic work to climb through the ranks and end up being in the committees that actually write the policy. This is a variation of stubbornness, and in fact, this is what I am teaching people these days as well, to do their best to end up in such committees. Because generally, the people who, let's say, drink two or three glasses of wine a week likely don't even think about it. They're not chronic alcoholics, so their mind is rarely, if ever, focused on alcohol policy. Those people represent the vast majority of the public that also has the least manifested interest in getting themselves into bureaucracies to secure their liberties. Who has the most manifested interest? The most intolerant minority. And as such, those are the only ones who win. Reversing this will necessarily require for us to grow a generation of activists who will be equally intolerant. The baseline position should be any regulation on alcohol is tantamount to murder. Get in the helicopter, you filthy commie. That's the starting position and then work from there, because the most intolerant always wins. All right, enough with this, because I will expand 
a little bit more in the sixth point. Until then, let's go to point number three, I guess. Yep, limitations of the 10% rule. This is the sim simplest chapter, really. So, as you might have gathered already, the 10% rule relies on the apathy of the majority and also the tendency of the majority to go for what is convenient rather than what is virtuous or right for them. We saw this play out with uh, Coptic Christians in Egypt and we saw this playing out with the almost shocking voluntary adoption of mass surveillance. This is why I'm having a lot of fun with the so-called Cambridge Analytica scandal, because it reveals to the public the very public's own hypocrisy. I mean, think about it. In theory, most of the public opposes mass surveillance, right? I mean, poll after poll shows that the vast majority of the public is skeptical of such power. Well, except for the United Kingdom, but I'm talking about normal countries here. Yet despite its theoretical opposition, the practice is diametrically opposed. Not only is most of the public very pro-mass surveillance, but so much so that the public is spending its own hard-earned cash to purchase all of the means to enable that surveillance even further. I still am uh, incapable of containing my laughter when I get utterly retarded arguments like, oh, but I can't live without a smartphone. <laughs> as if that's supposed to be a compelling argument or a remark that is grounded in reality. The truth is that all, was need, all that was needed to get this going was to reach a critical mass of 10% of the populace being stubborn enough and refusing to work with anything not smartphone, or as I like to call it, supercomputers with a GPS. And this was a long process. I mean, the first smartphone emerged in 1992, but smartphones started really taking off less than a decade ago. This shows us the first limitation of the 10% rule, the cost limitation. As usual, nothing in sociopolitics beats economics. If the cost of compliance with the minority rule is too high, then the 10% rule either doesn't apply at all or it applies in a marginal fashion. So, as long as smartphones were 10 times more expensive than normal people's phones, it didn't matter how stubborn the minority was. But once that changed, suddenly the increasingly insane demands of the tiny minority became palatable, especially when combined, combined to appeals to convenience, which in reality are meant to appeal to the general apathy of the plebs towards serious topics, such as privacy and security. That's how you get 70 to 80% of the populace using smartphones, and in some countries even higher than that, even though objectively most of them don't need them, never needed them, and will never need them. Objectively, those devices represent a net harm to the populace. Now, the Cambridge Analytica revelations might help create an opposite 10% stubborn minority. We'll see how that plays out. All right, another limitation, the spread of the minority. So, <clears throat> if the stubborn minority lives predominantly in one ghetto or in one city or even one state, then the 10% rule doesn't apply. That's why the United States doesn't overall kowtow to the beliefs and desires of Mormons, for instance, because they're all in Utah, although recently they've outgrown the state, but this is a recent phenomenon. There are about 7 million Mormons in the United States. If they were to be roughly equally distributed in the places that matter, that is to say, the big cities and the relevant centers of both cultural and political power, then you would suddenly see more bans on coffee, for instance. A real-life example of this is the Muslims in the United Kingdom. They are no more than 4% of the population, but because they're roughly equally distributed throughout the country, this has determined some disproportionate changes in the market. For instance, more than two-thirds of the meat being sold in the United Kingdom is halal certified. Why? Well, it's because most normal people would also eat halal meat, while the reverse is not true. 
Observant Muslims would never eat non-halal meat, and because the costs are roughly the same, it is easier, at least for big distributors, to just have most or indeed all of its production halal, rather than keep separate inventories, separate delivery lines, and so on and so forth. If Muslims were 10% of the population, then almost 100% of the meat would be halal. This is one of those instances where a free market doesn't ensure a desirable or virtuous result all by itself. You also need virtuous actors, but in the United Kingdom, such actors don't exist, although I suspect that it would be illegal or indeed grossly offensive to be virtuous at this point. Another limitation, inconvenience. This is somewhat uh, an extension of uh, the previous two. Basically, if there is an element of serious inconvenience, then the 10% rule doesn't apply, or it applies in a similar fashion. This usually works against normal people and in favor of the intransigent minority. It is convenient to get a supercomputer with a GPS and forfeit your right to privacy to be a, and then be a level-headed, virtuous human. It is easier and more convenient to buy halal than walk an extra mile and buy from those who refuse to finance a fascistic command and control political system. Convenience helps the 10% rule. Conversely, inconvenience frustrates it. That's how you get a rise in opposition to the utterly barbaric 3rd century BC practice of male genital mutilation. No matter how loud the intransigent minority screams, the fact remains that it is indeed inconvenient to maintain such a practice. This snowballs into intolerance for the practice, and with a little help, and by that I mean intentional and targeted activism from people like me to ferment an intransigent minority on the other side, legal bans are on the horizon. The basic position from uh, my side is simple. One circumcision is too many. Fuck off in the desert if you don't like it. No compromise, no prisoners, no moderation. I learned that from Islam. And it works. <laughs> so, if the minority intransigent position is not convenient, then the 10% rule is dissipated. If it is overtly inconvenient, then the rule doesn't apply at all. This should make sense, since the whole point of this rule is to exploit the apathy of the general public. All right, now uh, let's go to the next point. Number four, how did the right manage to lose sight of the 10% rule? Well, the short answer is that the right forgot that liberty is one generation away from disappearing. The right forgot what it was supposed to know in its heart, namely that civilization is the exception, not the rule, and maintaining the civilization involves active and hard work. This is a bit depressing. Basically, nothing of what I said so far is new information, but for those on the non-left, it has become forgotten information. As I said in other videos, it wasn't always the case that activism was a slur for do-nothing lowlifes who are paid shills for somebody else. For most of history, activism was a perfectly legitimate description of an individual who was agitating for a particular policy or a particular worldview. Up until as late as 1990, the activity of being an activist was still quite balanced with an almost equal number of normal people being activists alongside leftists. But then something happened. It's still not clear to me how and why, but it resulted in a sudden plummeting of the numbers of normal people engaging in activism of any kind and effectively surrendering the entire sector to the far left. Not to the left, not the liberals, not even the social democrats, but to the far, far left. And up until about five or six years ago, the field of activism was almost entirely of the far left, with the notable exception, I guess, of the NRA and the pro-life groups 
uh, in the United States. I guess that would be the only exceptions. Now, this particular state of affairs has had and continues to have serious consequences. It's a good thing that we on the non-left have managed to rebuild some of our spirits and uh, thank goodness non-leftist activists have started to re-emerge, including in highly organized and institutional forms. Now that is fantastic. If we could move even faster, that would be great. But 20 years of absence from the scene of activism leaves many of the present-day activists on the non-left ill-equipped for the job. There is a reason the most successful activists today are former leftists themselves, such as David Horowitz, or from the younger flock, take a Dave Rubin, for instance, or Candace Owens, or in Europe, where most of the right-wing figures have a left-wing background. This is not by accident, because those who grew up as normal people did not get the tools on how to spread the wisdom, whereas those who arrived to being normal people after being brought up as leftists have received these tools. On top of that, as a longtime patron of this channel was noticing, uh, the right has also gotten into the bad habit of being almost exclusively focused on the next election and totally ignoring the long-term game. That is a terrible development. And these two factors, and likely others too, such as parents being less interested in providing values to their children, these factors combined led to a significant decrease in knowledge of practical politics on the right, including the knowledge about the 10% rule. Ideas have consequences. Decisions have consequences. When you decide to give your child the most, uh, uh, the most in terms of material possessions, but utterly ignore values, well, you get the current mess. And it can get worse. All right, let's go to number five. Present day attempts at using the 10% rule. The most obvious example is the far left's attempt to use a bunch, of, a bunch of teenagers from Florida to push for inherently totalitarian gun confiscation policies. The calculus, from the left-wing perspective, is self-evident. Everyone cares about teenagers being killed, and polls suggest that a slim majority of Americans would support some gun control. Moreover, the left may not have 10%, but it has a 7-9% to stubborn minority for which nothing short of gun, full gun confiscation is good enough. So from, that, from their point of view, if they combine these things with a bit of emotionally driven agitprop using the voices of some ignorant teenagers, they can get a larger share of the apathetic public in their direction. That's cute, but wrong. And by wrong, I don't mean wrong policy, because these things are universal, no matter how wrong the policy is. By wrong, I mean wrong calculus. For starters, no poll has indicated even a third of the public supporting far-left ideas about guns. Yes, in principle, most, things, most people think some gun control is not a terribly bad idea. But when you get down to details, that majority disappears outright when the far-left policy proposals are put forth. And since this is a constitutional issue that isn't adjudicated privately, but through votes, well, this time apathy works against the left. Secondly, the left forgot the geographic spread limitation of the 10% rule. Yeah, sure, they may have 10% or 9 or 7, it doesn't really matter, but it's not evenly spread. The stubborn minority outright doesn't exist in most of the country. Gun control is to the left what Mormonism is to the religious right. Both are perfectly regional and ghettoized phenomena that simply do not matter when it comes to federal level, at least not in a way that will be of consequence. Because again, being a constitutional issue, the rules of adjudication are entirely different than, let's say, 
the policy on alcohol guidelines or smoking in bars or imports of coffee or indeed the sale of halal certified meat. Some issues are simply not fit for the purpose of the 10% rule. In other words, the left is trying to use an unfit tool to fight this issue. Now, I personally don't blame them. I mean, after all, <clears throat> we shouldn't interrupt the enemy when he's committing a mistake. But I also don't blame them because they've already tried most of the rest of the tools and failed almost every single time. That's, that's on one hand because their case is really, really weak. And on the other hand, because gun rights is one of the few issues where the right has maintained some energy and clarity on the activism front. All right, another example. Uh, hashtag delete Facebook, launched by leftist propagandists and some useful idiots in light of the uh, Cambridge Analytica pseudo scandal. This one might actually work, and it's one of the rare cases where I actually agree with the left, although for entirely different reasons. The key for the success of this will rely on getting a distributed 10%. That is, Assuming the goal is to take down Facebook, which is my personal goal. I don't know what the left wants uh, from this, and I frankly don't care. We should just go ahead and subvert it out for to suit our purposes. But in order for this to work, we'll need 10% of the most active users on Facebook and also the users being roughly similarly distributed geographically. In other words, Mozilla tweeting out that it hashtag deletes Facebook is not particularly helpful. Mozilla Firefox has about 90 million users and its market share is diminishing. Part of that is their own fault. I mean, until Firefox Quantum emerged, their browser was at a shit. Not to mention the tens of millions of users they lost during the Brendan Eich scandal, which was the first time the consumers showed organized non-left backlash against leftist management. Since then, I have personally directed several tens of thousands of clients permanently away from Mozilla, exclusively for political reasons, and I'm not the only one. But part of Mozilla's diminishing influence is due to Google's aggressive tactics to attract clients for its own botnet, commonly known as Google Chrome, by far the most anti-privacy and overall the worst browser ever developed on the market. The point I'm trying to make here is that getting Mozilla or Elon Musk or whatever to hashtag delete Facebook will not make much of a difference. What will make a difference is to convince highly active users to engage with this and have them distributed roughly equally, geographically speaking. Now, I'll explain how in a future video. After all, the left will soon forget about this and the topic will drop out from the headlines. But the movement away from Facebook could indeed be kept alive and grown far beyond this and towards a different kind of success. Facebook is now vulnerable, so agitation combined with active measures and bearing in mind the 10% rule could indeed take down Facebook. I will explain in a separate practical politics video, or maybe I'll write an article on my own website, when the website will actually work, that is, which is work in progress. Anyway, uh, let's go to point number six, using the rule as an individual activist or small group. Now, I have alluded to this quite heavily in the video called The Basics of Subversion, which I also mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. By the way, do watch it. Uh, then I give the example of increased tolerance for marijuana as a topic where the mainstream culture uh, has been successfully subverted without obtaining a broad consensus on the topic. What I did not say back then and will mention now is that in the case of marijuana, the group subverted was precisely the hardliners. Basically, any law exists only as long as it has a stubborn 10% minority that not just absolutely agrees with that specific law, but is also willing to consistently engage in society to make sure the law is respected and enforced and abided by. Once you obliterate that minority, either through subversion or through silencing tactics, then the law can safely be changed or allowed to fall into desuetude. 
And again, this applies to many things, but it's particularly obvious uh, on vices. For instance, in Cyprus, smoking in bars is forbidden from a legal standpoint. In practice, nobody cares, because a 10% intransigent minority does not exist. As a result, the law is never enforced and it's worth less than the paper it's written on, which is good. Such laws are inherently retarded. But this can be extended to almost anything. For instance, in theory, most countries of Europe have some variation of hate speech laws. Yet in sane cases of censorship or legal consequences for speech that should always be permitted, don't emerge equally or proportionately from all countries of Europe that have such laws. Instead, they emerge disproportionately from just a handful of them. The reason is, again, the 10% rule. The intransigent minority that is willing to be militant to make sure, make sure such insane laws are being respected simply doesn't exist in many countries of Europe, particularly in the Intermarium, but also Switzerland, Italy or Portugal. And this is a lesson we can use in our own practical activism. Not only we should try to use the 10% rule to our advantage to subvert a process, like for instance, the example that I gave multiple times uh, in getting one or two people of our own into a committee that approves school curricula. If we have two of our own uh, out of the 10 people committee that decides, then we will almost always be able to block leftist messaging in that particular school or district. So not only we should try to use that, but you should and could bear in mind that something can be done when there is a, a, a already a 10% intransigent minority that works against you. Basically, if you find one uh, of that already entrenched, don't be shy to try to subvert that one as well and essentially obliterate it. Or in plainer English, Obliterating the 10% intransigent minority is, in practice, just as good as getting what you want in terms of policy. Bearing in mind the 10% rule is also mandatory if you attempt to commit subversion for destruction or subversion by discrediting. Someone did pose this question in the comment section asking whether it would be wise to try to get the looniest candidate on the list as a means to destroy an opposing political party or organization or whatever. The question is very legitimate precisely because the concern itself is legitimate. What if you end up helping the looniest one get elected? This is why I always advise to try this on small political parties, precisely because the consequences of getting it wrong are insignificant and also because small political parties already start with the handicap of, well, being small. Subversion, unlike the 10% rule, is more of an art than a science, and only through prolonged experience one ends up in a place where he gets most things right. Uh, oh, and by the way, Nobody gets everything right all the time, not over the long run. I mean, the political operative that never gets anything wrong is either very young or not much of a political operative. It's easy to get five things right out of five attempts, a lot harder to get it 10 out of 10, and downright impossible to get 50 things right out of 50 attempts. Basically, the more experienced you become, the more likely you are to also get some things wrong. And that's okay. Nobody is perfect, least of all humans engaging in the dirty game of practical politics. That's why I always tell people to look for saints in the church, if they believe in that, and leave politics alone. Politics is messy. There are no saints in politics, just different shades of de decency and also, yes, different shades of brutal insanity, sociopathy, meanness, and sadly, totalitarianism. So yeah, there aren't many more things to be said here because this is just a rule to bear in mind while applying all the other tools already explained, namely agitprop, black propaganda, subversion, and active measures. Oh, right. I didn't make a video on active measures, didn't I? Well, I might do that at some point, though I'm not hurrying up with that one for operational security reasons. Ah, all right, uh, final point, number seven, conclusions. 
gee, this is really getting long, so I'll be brief. The consequences of uh, ignoring the 10% rule are usually quite brutal. Basically, the difference between liberty and tyranny oftentimes boils down to who understands the 10% rule and who doesn't. A shining example is the prohibition in the United States. The 10% intransigent minority of the temperance movement, which was an alliance between feminists and fascists, by the way, won over the cooler heads, ironically, precisely because those on the side of sanity underestimated the whole thing. Also, the 10% rule is neither moral nor immoral. It's amoral. That's what makes it a rule, because it works every time the conditions for it to work are being met. It doesn't matter whose side it, fa it favors. If the conditions are met, the 10% rule will manifest itself. Understanding it and being aware of it makes you a better activist because sometimes it inherently favors liberty, so one style of activism is thus more useful than other, and when it doesn't for favor liberty, then clearly another tactic is more useful. Bearing in mind, the 10% rule will help you make uh, better decisions when approaching political action. Again. It works on any political action, precisely because it comes straight out of the human nature. The 10% rule predates capital P politics itself, and it likely predates human language itself, and clearly predates any form of human civilization. The left doesn't understand where this is coming from, that's why they sometimes apply it wrongly. But through trial and error, the left has become far more astute than it ever was at applying it, whereas normal people have almost entirely stopped being even aware of it. And that, my fellow deplorables, needs to change. Anyway, now I omitted from uh, this presentation the history of how the left ended up using it because then the video would have exceeded 90 minutes and likely even more. And the sweet spot for such courses appeared to be around uh, one hour or so. Uh, as a result, I'll stop here and uh, cede the floor to you. Have you encountered the 10% rule in practice? And if yes, how did it work? And if not, do you plan to pay more attention? Because it likely already happened uh, around you and you didn't notice. That's why I'm asking this. Anyway, uh, please do tell me in the comments and let's get the ball rolling because this is the kind of knowledge that needs to reach as many non-leftists as possible, really. Uh, all right, and with all of that being said, thank you all for watching. Thank you for your consistent and generous support. Please do consider throwing a buck about towards me if you derive any value from the work being done here. Please do subscribe to my social media. And I'll see you all soon on the Freedom Alternative.